Thank you. Um, right, so this is also part of the work that happened um, for the privacy goal. Um, and yeah, we are going to look at how to talk to network services in a, in a secure fashion. Um, and the subtitle was kind of spoiled by, uh, by Ivan already. Um, we'll see it's not all that easy, unfortunately. Um, why we are doing this, um, I think, is, is pretty clear, right? Um, most of you in the, in the last one or two days have been connected to an open Wi-Fi somehow. And that usually means everybody else can just listen in on what you are communicating, unless, of course, the connection is uh, encrypted. And uh, I guess many of you also got in, in contact with captive portals, for example, in the hotel. Um, so that's something where the server or the captive portal pretends to be whoever you actually want to talk to. And if your application doesn't verify that it's actually talking to the server it wants to talk to, it might just happily send out authentication details, passwords, session tokens, whatever, to that captive portal. Um, so this is some esoteric corner case if you are a public enemy uh, hunted down by the NSA. This is really something that happens pretty much at any hotel, airport, public Wi-Fi, uh, whatever you get in, uh, in contact with. Um, the usual technology to do that is uh, TLS, and Transport Layer Security, uh, formerly SSL, um, so it's more or less the same thing, just um, yeah, with some, some issues fixed. Um, most often you get in touch with that uh, in HTTP URLs or HTTPS URLs, so the S makes the difference and it uh, uh, connects in, a, in an encrypted and authenticated fashion. Um, and as Ingo rightfully mentioned, um, this isn't limited to HTTP, even if HTTP is the most common one. Um, several other protocols, like the whole email set, um, they basically use the same technology just on a, um, uh, on a socket level. Uh, so most of what we are going to see here also applies to that. Um, so yeah, in theory, that should be it, right? You use an HTTPS URL and you're fine and you enable a TLS on your socket for, for non-HTTP and you should be fine. Well, um, now the Ivan stuff kicks in, right? Unfortunately, it's not that easy. Um, the first and probably a bit surprising thing is we tend to forget to actually do this. Um, maybe not on like the primary feature of your application. So if you're writing a chat client or an email client, you tend to pay attention that that communication is, is properly encrypted or, or secured, right? Um, but that is usually not the only thing that can communicate with some network service in your application. Um, there are simple things like links to websites, license information, or further information in your documentation. Um, if you put an HTTP URL there, you click on it, right? Connection is, uh, is not encrypted. Might not be as severe as leaking your emails, but um, it's also those small things that count. Um, we also found that in download URLs for external content, um, Okay, new stuff, um, and uh, some, some block content in aggregator, for example, in the default installation, um, where this is already a bit more severe. Um, and we found it in, in places for, um, for content sharing, so where you're actually leaking out data. So this is stuff like paste bin integration or image bin integration for sharing data as part of, um, for example, an email application. Um, now, how do we address this? Um, it's unfortunately much harder as search and replace for HTTP and replace that with HTTPS um, because XML files tend to use HTTP URIs as identifiers rather than as addresses that get resolved. So you find that, for example, in SVG files, if we do a 
do a global search and replace, right? We, we break all those files by trying to fix the network addresses, so it's not that easy. During the privacy sprint, uh, Sandro and I worked on a, on a script that does this properly. Uh, and there's a still pending review on Fabricator that tries to inject that as a global unit test for all ECM users. That's a bit of a hack, but that seemed to be the, um, the best way we found to make this as widely rolled out as, as possible. Um, and even if you don't do that, there's these scripts that you can run over your code base um, that checks for, um, for URLs and optionally also replaces them. Um, on top of that, there is, uh, so this is basically the static approach, uh, static code analysis. Um, on top of that, there is um, uh, various tools that allow you to look at your runtime traffic um, but with that, it's usually much harder to capture the rare secondary use cases, right? So this works nicely for the primary communication of your application. Um, capturing a click on a specific link in your documentation in a Wireshark dump, um, that doesn't really work. So, but yeah, let's, um, um, let's assume we are talking to a good server that actually redirects us to um, to an HTTPS URL. Um, many servers nowadays do that, but is that enough? Um, so first of all, are we actually following that redirect? Um, we will see later on when we look at the, the tools we actually have to, to do this, or the, the libraries, um, that is not necessarily the case. Um, and then there's the case, do we follow redirects in the wrong direction? So if somebody tricks, this, uh, tricks or injects a, a redirect from a secure site to an insecure site, that's usually not something we would want to follow. And we'll see in a few cases we follow that as well. So uh, that's something to take care of. Um, and then there's an extension, um, strict transport security for HTTP that allows the, the server basically to tell us for the next half year, you can expect me to offer an encrypted site. And if you get an unencrypted link, always upgrade to encrypted. So that requires to keep some, some state locally. Um, and it's, it's an, again, another building block that prevents these, um, these either downgrade attacks or the uh, capture portals um, confusing this. Um, to see if, if we are actually doing this or to what extent we are doing this, uh, let's have a look at the two major libraries or components we have to, to actually do HTTP communication. And that's uh, uh, QNetwork Access Manager um, coming from QNetwork and KIO. Um, so network access manager. Um, redirects are off by default. That's uh, Ben's favorite feature in there. Um, and you explicitly need to enable that. And you have um, several policies you can pick from. Um, and the only one that actually does what you would expect it, uh, or to add a redirect behavior that is kind of what one would expect is the no less safe redirection policy. So you explicitly need to set that on Network Access Manager and then you have um, the redirect problem fixed. Um, strict transport security is supported, but it's off by default. So you need to switch this on. And persistency of the, of the results you get from the server is also off by default. So you need a, uh, basically a third call on Network Access Manager to switch this on. And then you have something that, um, that does most things uh, correctly. Um, when we look at how to move forward, there's some only vaguely related things uh, coming in like cookie and cache handling. Uh, so I'm, I won't go in detail in, in this one here, but uh, cookie persistence is also not, um, uh, not done in Network Access Manager. 
from a privacy point of view, that's actually a, a sensible default. A cookie persistence is something that usually only browsers should do, if at all. Uh, in application code, you usually don't want that. So how does uh, KIO perform against that? Um, so here, redirects work by default, but they actually work a bit too well. So KIO um, happily follows a redirect to an, um, to an insecure site as well. Um, and there is no knobs to turn this off. So you have to live with that. Um, then uh, strict transport security is not supported at all. Um, that's due to KIO being fairly old, um, predating that, that standard. Um, and that's part of the problem in KIO, right? Uh, the HTTP implementation there isn't really as actively maintained as it would probably, or as it probably should be, especially as there's also newer HTTP standards coming out. Uh, and in KIO, we have persistence of cookies by default, which, as I said, for applications might not be desirable. Um, then we have an, another subject to look at, and that is um, what happens if we encounter TLS errors. So um, some outdated or wrong um, crypto format or, or encryption algorithm, um, some untrusted, unknown, or self-signed certificate, um, or like something like the capture portal messing all of this up. Um, first, maybe the question, how should those errors be handled? Um, and there's, there's basically two approaches. The one we know from the browser, where the user is asked and given the opportunity to overwrite that temporarily or possibly persistently. Um, and then the other option is to just treat it as an error. And uh, I think the, the recommendation would be if we are dealing with an address that the user has entered, so like in the browser, or like in an email application or in a chat application where I configure um, a server. Um, then we need to give the user the ability to actually overwrite that because it might be my own server with a self-signed certificate. Um, I mean, that's less relevant in the um, days of Let's Encrypt, but um, there's at least valid scenarios where the, the overwrite might be necessary. And then there is... Um, basically internal API calls to hard-coded endpoints. Um, for those, I think we should treat it as an, as an hard error. So, because otherwise you're behind the capture portal and your weather applet is asking you if you want to trust that other certificate. You didn't even trigger a network operation, right? So how am I supposed to decide this? Um, how can we do that? Or how is that um, error handling done? Um, you probably know that message box you get from KIO is we have an error, show me the details, and ignore or ignore persistently. Um, that is infrastructure provided by KIO, um, but it also can be used in combination with um, QSSL socket, so the, the non-HTTP version from Qt, and starting with the next framework's release, it will also be possible for um, to use that together with Network Access Manager. Um, before that, Network Access Manager will always uh, basically hard fail on a TLS error. Um, but with the, the next release, that will at least be on uh, feature parity. Um, how can you test if your application behaves correctly in the face of such errors? Um, and that's where badssl.com comes in. Um, that is a large collection of servers set up with specific errors. Um, 
So you can have weak encryption or self-signed certificates and all that stuff, which is usually very annoying to, to set up manually or to intentionally trigger. So it's, it's actually um, uh, very helpful to run your application against that and see if it behaves correctly. And uh, I mean, this is uh, focused on HTTP um, uh, communication because I think it's done by the Chromium team. Um, but you can also use that for non-HTTP applications. Um, they will, of course, once they manage to set up the encryption, they will fail because the protocol doesn't match. Um, but if you get to that point, then um, you are at least sure that your SSL error handling is correct. Um, and to show you how that looks like, um, I wrote a little demo application that um, uses the uh, four different um, methods we have to, um, to talk to in a network endpoint. Um, by default, they are basically, this is running with their vanilla configuration, right? No option changed. How many of those think they, uh, or how many of those options you think will work out of the box with this very suspicious website uh, set up there? Any idea? Right, it's, uh, it's certainly not all of them, so let's, uh, where's my mouse cursor? Let's try this, uh, Network Access Manager. That seems to work at first, but actually it fails on the redirect of that website. So with Network Ma Manager out of the box, we can't get to this suspicious website. And if I try TCP socket, um, that fails as well, and I'll get to, to that uh, in a bit. The default in TCP socket is SSL version three, which is a protocol so old that OpenSSL says, I'm not going to touch this. Um, and the other two actually work. Um, and I can also show you how this works for the, let's say the self-signed self uh, test. So K, KO will actually give us that well-known dialog, right? Um, and Network Access Manager by default will just fail. Um, but if I use the, uh, the same UI for that, oh, that used to work. No, uh, this is for the different version. Oh, yeah, I might have the, the old framework one, so let me show it for this one. Um, so that KIO feature is now available for, uh, for all the cute options. Um, the redirect stuff, I think we have a test for that as well. So this is an HTTPS URL redirecting to HTTP. And if I put this on the correct policy, we should get an error here, right? And KIO will um, happily execute that and give us all kinds of information. Um, so none of them really is ideal, and the defaults are, um, well, you, you need to actually set the defaults correctly for, for this to, to work. Um, but with this, you can at least play with the various options and, and see how, how they behave and what, um, and if that's what you, what you would expect. Um, right, then we have uh, briefly seen that in the demo. If you don't have HTTP, there is a QSSL socket um, as the Qt option, and we have KTCP socket, um, which is also, I think this is from the time before there was QSSL socket, so it's a fairly legacy thing. Um, and as we saw, it, it defaults to an, an communication protocol that even OpenSSL considers outdated. Uh, so you explicitly need to set that to use a secure protocol. It's actually, that's how the, the API is called. And then it, uh, it kind of works like the SSL socket. 
Uh, and both of them you can connect to the SSL UI. Um, so you can have the manual, the manual override for TLS errors if you, if you need them. Um, so this is basically just, or at that point so far, mostly complaining about stuff not working. So how do we get it, um, uh, or how do we move forward from this? Um, and based on the discussions um, we had on this, uh, with David, for example, um, uh, one suggestion is that we add um, a K network access manager, which is uh, basically a Q network access manager with sensible defaults. Um, so ideally, that thing only has three lines of codes in, in its constructor. Um, because with the, um, with the introduction of the strict transport security feature, we saw that um, we will need to adapt to changes in Network Access Manager. Um, and we can't rely on the defaults there being like we want them, right? Um, and if we are now already at three lines of setup code for Network Access Manager that we would need to do correctly in each application, that seems too error prone and um, too hard to maintain. So on the other hand, having another framework for a three line class is also not ideal, right? But um, at least that gives us a central point to, to configure this. And likely there would be more in there if we look at uh, default cache handling and an and optional cookie persistence and that kind of stuff. So. Um, right, or well, do we want to wait until Q6? Are we assuming that within Q6, Network Access Manager will aid change its default and will not get to the point again where we need to change the defaults? Because, I mean, there's reasons why they didn't change the defaults, right? It changes behavior um, for the redirects quite drastically, actually, possibly with security implications, right? So um, I can see the point why, they, why there is the behavior in Network Access Manager the way it is. Um, yeah, it's, uh, of course, that is, I mean, this is, not, this is not a statement on what we are going to do, right? This is proposal based on discussion for options we might want to look into. Um, uh, so that is one of the ideas. Um, then, yeah, I, I wrote the slides before some of the things already got fixed. So the um, SSL error handling for Network Access Manager, that is, uh, um, I think it's, it's integrated, right? So it should be in the, in the next release. Um, right, and then there is the question, what do we do with the legacy HTTP implementations we have? Um, and that is mainly the HTTP IO slave and the, um, the WebDAV support, uh, which is also in, in CalDAV, CARDAV, in, in PIM. Um, I think it would be a good idea to rebase that on top of Network Access Manager so we don't maintain our own HTTP implementation anymore, especially in the light of HTTP as a standard actually moving again with the innovations coming from, from Google. Um, Q-Network Access Manager is behind the the browser's there, but we are way behind in KAO. So I'm not sure if it's worth to, to maintain that anymore, especially with nobody actively working on it. Um, well, and finally, it looks like there is no good reason to keep KTCP socket, and that could be um, basically phased out in favor of uh, QSSL socket. QSSL socket seems to have sensible defaults um, so that's the only one where you actually, where you saw in the demo, there is not a single checkbox for it, apart from the, I actually want the override, which is a sensible option to have. Um, so I think that is a, a transition uh, we probably want to look into. There's actually only like six places or so in, in LXR that use TCP socket, but swapping it out for SSL socket is a delicate task because you're touching very security relevant code. Um, that will at least be 
kind of my proposal on how to move forward on this. Uh, and that's uh, hopefully something we can discuss further during the week. Um, yeah, so I think it's, uh, we have seen that um, we basically have all the building blocks, but it is quite tricky to assemble them in a way that you get the optimal uh, behavior. And it's quite easy to assemble them in a way that things either don't work or have some problematic, security-wise problematic behavior. Um, I also think there is still a lot of room in improving the tools that support us in verifying that we are doing this correctly. Um, and in a way that, we, and the tools that allow us to find places where we are not doing this correctly. Uh, and doing this correctly is, of course, uh, very important, uh, confirming also what uh, uh, Ivan said in the morning. Yeah, um, that's it. There is a KF6 buff on Monday where changes to KIO might be on, on topic, so that might be a place where we can further discuss this. Thank you, Volker. Other questions? Uh, that uh, KNAM thing, shouldn't that be somehow put into Qt so that everyone could use uh, Qt, sane default network access manager, that then actually could move its defaults to those who opt into sane behavior by default? Um, I mean, the, the closer this is to a network access manager and therefore closer to Qt network, uh, I think the better, the more people benefit from this. Um, I think that, that probably requires talking to the Qt people. If we can have like a same default option or same default wrapper somewhere in Qt and if we agree on what is sane, right? Um, integration with the, the error handling, that is UI on our side, so that certainly needs to be somewhat external. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's certainly an, an option to consider as well. So. Uh, so I, I just checked LXR for how yeah. many case, so KTCP sockets are. There are not that many, as you said, but one of them is TCP slave base, right? So basically, our all our slaves, when they call socket, they get a yep. KTCP socket. So that, that it, that that's a bit of a multiplier, right? That, that just codes as one, but I guess yep. there's various slaves on top of that one. That yeah, um, yeah, I at like expect it to be a KTCP socket. I don't know what's the actual difference between TCP socket and SSL socket nowadays, but I mean it's. TCP socket uses an SSL socket, but wraps most of the API, including all the SSL relevant API. Um, and it messes with the defaults. Some of this bad, some of this might be useful. Um, it's, it's not even documented, so it, it doesn't even show up on, on the API KDE org site. So it's, uh, and it's a fairly extensive class. So it's very hard to assess how what subtle things will will break in the port, and yes, TCP slave base is one of the interesting things. Uh, and I think there's the IMAP and SMTP handling. Yeah. They look easy on first sight, but this is like multi-threaded code with the error handling for TLS happening in a different thread. And so touching all of that is uh, it's not an, a simple search and replace. Um, yeah, besides to mention one is the only. The remaining user is conversation. Right. Um, but I would guess that is a similar complexity as for IMAP and SMTP and so on. So, um, but this, this is something that we can, I think, step by step migrate, right? It's, it's not something where we need new API in any of the, the platforms. But at least avoid using that in new code. Anything else? Okay, thank you so much.